Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, Two Guys and Some Horror, or should I say three. Today we have our second guest star for the show, well, officially as we record, Mr. Jared Rounceval. Jared, would you like to say hi? Yeah. Hey, how's it going, guys? Great to be here. Hey, welcome, Dick. Glad to have you. Agreed, 100%. So today we are, we're actually watching The Thing, and uh, we we had a couple people who, who were willing to, to come on the show but uh, Jared was was the one who was who seemed the most eager. Uh, Jared, what what kind of what kind of attracted you to kind of be on the podcast? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, I'm a, a I, I wouldn't say I'm a major horror buff, but I'm I'm pretty enthusiastic. I think uh, the older I get, the more I enjoy uh, uh, moral ambiguities, and uh, I'm, as far as far as horror goes, definitely uh, cosmic horror and whatnot. I think that might be what attracted me to uh, the thing specifically. Great. Awesome. Now, the thing is uh, one of my favorite uh, horror movies, uh, especially one thing people might know that this is actually a remake. But when you say the thing, most people think you're talking about John Carpenter's 1981 horror film. But this is not the only one. That's correct. So uh, big props to John Campbell Jr., who is the initial writer of the story for the thing. Um, it was a novella. Very similar to like when we talked about the tall, the tall grass a couple weeks back. Um, it, it's, it was just a, a really nice, well-written short story. And uh, we've had now multiple adaptations of this story with the director's own little, you could say, twists or changes or modifications to the stories, which is really cool to see. Um, you know, the similar premise is just... Uh, if we're ready to dive in there, not to rush the show um, or anything like that, but the similar premise is the idea that aliens crash land on on our planet, uh, get buried in ice, you know, thousands and thousands of years possibly go by, and then some scientists uh, dig up those those remains and start to do kind of experiments on them, and and the thing is unleashed. Um, and then in, in specifically in John Carpenter's version, um, the main fear or, or horror aspect is the, um, the non-trusting partners being involved. Would you agree there, Clark? Uh, yeah, it's, it's essentially any one of us could be this creature. Any one of us could be this thing that's taking over us and duplicating us in some way, shape or form. It, this movie especially is uh, probably one of the most unique in terms of how they actually build up that tension. If we want, we, yeah. Like it, we start out actually with a helicopter flying around. There's a dog running towards a base. And these, uh, these two Swedish men are chasing this dog. And this dog kind of uh, he runs towards these, this, these Americans at this American scientific research facility. We're introduced to like a couple characters, but these Swedish guys, they're... One of them pulls out a thermite grenade, and he's about to throw it, but he drops it. It's mm -hmm. just like digging through the snow, and then he blows up. Uh, the other scientist kind of comes in. He, he pulls in a gun, and he accidentally shoots one of the American... Uh, I don't know if he's a researcher. I think it was... Uh, it wasn't Windows. Um, but he shoots one of them. And so the uh, the main leader of this group, Gary kills him with a headshot like right in the middle of the head and then from there that's kind of where the dog gets introduced and as a viewer we're kind of like well, what's going on what have we I, gotten ourselves into <laughs> I, real quick, I, I really loved that intro scene um with the the, the, the two helicopter pilots you, you mentioned he, he kind of drops the grenade but it's kind of a he, he pulls the pin and it seems to just fly out of his hand mm -hmm. and, uh, super funny to watch I wonder if the gloves, like, snow gloves are pretty hard to hold stuff in. Yeah. Uh, and if you're, I don't know, wet from the snow or whatnot, maybe it made it a little bit more slippery. I'm probably giving him way too much benefit of the doubt here because he was an idiot in the first place. Mm. <clears throat> but, yeah, we'll we'll give him that. So is it Bennings that he shoots? It's it's the ginger, right? The red-haired guy? I think it's it, Bennings. It might be Bennings. Yeah, because cause I remember later on then Bennings, he's yelling at someone. He's like, come on, man, I just got shot. Turn the noise down or whatever. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, that's right. It was uh, Nalls in the kitchen, I think. 
I just got shot today trying to catch some sleep. <laughs> yep. Even before this scene, we're introduced to the main character, or the, I guess, the protagonist? Kurt Russell's character, RJ uh, McReady. And he's playing computer chess. And the computer beats him, so he opens it up and he pours his whiskey inside the computer and just ruins everyone's uh, only video game. That cheating I little, bitch. I was a little disappointed in him. So, <laughs> I love this because we were just kind of talking about this a little bit before we started recording. And Clark brought up to me, he, he raised the awareness on the moment when uh, Max says, we need to have somebody in charge who's a little bit more level-headed, less temperamental. Yeah. And I and at the time watching the movie, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, Mac, you're the most level-headed person right now. But you have shown signs of anger for no reason. When he poured the whiskey yeah. on the computer. Like, they're on this, they're, they're on this base in Antarctica and... What do they have to do? Out. They have in the rec room. They have ping pong, pool, that chess game. Maybe yeah. they have darts. We really don't see much more than that. I mean, correct me they if I'm wrong, them. guys. But this is they, they, what eighty two. Right? So that that uh, that chess game is probably worth a lot of money, right? Yeah, probably yeah. quite a bit, hundreds of dollars, if not more than that. Just uh, well. For back then, I guess a couple hundred dollars might be a lot more than it is now. But even no, it was it was a little ridiculous. So, uh, did you mention that the the sheriff shot into uh, the Norwegian's eye? Did you did you drop that little note there? I maybe I did. I don't remember that, but he did. He pew pewed him. He pew pewed him. him. Yeah, he knocks out the window, the glass window, and then so perfectly yeah. just shoots him right into the eye, and the eye kind you kind of see the blood. What was in the eye? Out. I thought it was in the middle of the head. Okay. Yeah, it was. Uh, this is a pretty gnarly effect. Um, we get a lot of really great practical effects in this movie, which is huge, um, especially for the time that it was. So, 1982, and that was the million dollar shot. <laughs> yeah. So, speaking of money, the budget for this was 15 million dollars in 1982. You think about John Carpenter's budgets budgets on films. This is, uh, by the way, just a reminder. This is week two of our John Carpenter month in February, so we're really excited to be talking about his movies. But the thing had a fifteen million dollar budget compared to like Halloween in seventy nine or whatever it was that only got seven hundred and fifty thousand, say. So you're talking about not even a million to fifteen million from Universal to make this film. It's mm -hmm. insane, and they, and I mean, bombed. It did. It, it bombed. John Carpenter thought it was going to be a huge waste of time um, for everybody. And uh, he's really glad. Obviously, he'd be really glad right now to think back and go, wow, I was wrong. We, we actually did something great. Well, it came out two weeks after E.T. That's why it bombed, because everybody was kind of looking for more like a Close Encounters of the Third Kind or or is it Fourth Kind? I don't remember the name of the movie, but all of the all the alien movies at that point were all super friendly and it's like, oh, they're here to kind of make peace with us. And then this kind of comes out and it's like, no, they're they're here to kill you and imitate you. Yeah, let's not forget how dangerous aliens can truly be. <laughs> right. And as as the viewer right now, we, we have not been introduced to anything. The, and they're in the rec room. They, they're playing before uh, some of the people are about to leave this uh, this research base and go check out the Norwegian one. But uh, before that happens, we see the shadow of the dog. We see the dog enter the room, and we see the shadow of someone. Correct. So that's put a pin on that. Yeah. Um, that's – yeah, there's so many fan theories about that as well. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a little deeper into that later, some reasons why it was done, how it was done. I mean, unless you want to crack that one open right now. I mean, we can. It's not a bad one to talk about. I mean, all we see, it's a guy with curly hair, but beyond that, we don't know what happens. Right. Uh, if but the, the, the really quick viewer there, wouldn't know. Go ahead. I, if I can chime in, yeah. I, I had heard actually yeah. that, that John Carpenter didn't want anybody to uh, get any context clues from that. So supposedly he had uh, he had actually used somebody they just had uh, on set working on the film for that shadow. And yep. It belonged to one of the... Uh, well, uh, one of the uh, cast members. It was none of the actors. That's correct. And that that's the piece that I was kind of wanting to, to talk about. Because I think it's really important um, for us to just realize here that 
John Carpenter didn't want to give any hints away or try to paint any anyone as as the thing right off the bat. He wanted it to be completely unknown to all of us as viewers uh, and, and kind of let us start to get that panic as well of like, oh my God, who is it? Who could it be? Who's infected? But before, if this is your first time seeing, you don't think anything. You're not no. thinking anything about the dog. You're not thinking about like these guys are chasing and they're trying to kill a dog. But then they're in the Swedish base or the Norwegian base. Sorry, I keep saying Swedish. Uh, in the helicopter, by the way, before I forget, like there's 15 cans of kerosene in that helicopter that that they can't that came from the uh, Norwegian base that they pointed out. But then, so they have some sort of conversation in the base, and they make a decision. Okay, we need to check out what's, what went on there in the Norwegian one. They go there, and they find John Carpenter's frozen dead body inside there. Kind of looks like he cut his wrists. And there's blood dripping down. There's some frozen blood around him as well. His neck. They, he has a Colombian mm-hmm. necktie. Yeah. Um, which also is confusing because, or to me it was confusing, because the wrists I understand if he committed suicide. But he wouldn't have slit his own neck and then also went and done the wrists. And that, I don't know, like, to me there's just way too much there to unpack to really, like, say this is what happened, Right. I thought he slid his wrists, and I, I, I'm. But did he just slit his neck? No. So uh, you see, when they pan over um, John Carpenter's wrist... fake dead body, right? Yeah. It, it's you can see his neck is completely uh, slashed. You can see it right. split, and you can see where the blood dropped down a little bit there, creating like a bloody beard of mm-hmm. icicles. But as his hands are also hanging down by his sides, you see the straight razor that he had. And the blood dripping off of his wrists as well. So, to me, I don't know which one... Maybe he slit one wrist with the hand and then slit his throat. And then just bled out. Yeah, that, I mean, that would make more sense. he's yeah. still gripping onto the razor. So I don't think he used the other hand for anything. Probably not. I mean, he probably wouldn't have had much time either bleeding out like that. Do um, you think the idea there was that um, the, the two pilots had, had just left him there after, after that? Or... Do you think the aliens involved or I think there's too much for us to read into with it personally yeah. to know we can come up with all of our own fan theory, you know. Mm-hmm. But they don't the the crazy thing, one one thing that's really nuts about um these films is like John Carpenter doesn't want to give you an answer most of the time. He wants to let you kind of formulate your own answer and and decide on your own what what the hell is going on, which I love. I mean, I love it. That's why he is probably my favorite director when it comes to horror films um but at the same time like come on man give us a little bit of like give us something a little bit more (laughs) um so to talk about i just want to dig into the characters real quick because i want to get uh everyone's opinion just on so two questions who is your favorite character um out of out of all of these characters that we meet and then who is your least favorite character um, we'll go ahead and start with the guest, Jared. Uh, go ahead and give give us uh, give us your answer. Sure. Oh, I mean, it's, it has to be McCready, right? Um, Kurt Russell is just awesome in this movie, and I, I love his hat too. <laughs> like, okay. Man. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The the entire time, I just you know, yeah, I'm always on his side. Uh, as far as uh, Lee's favorite, um, who who was the uh, the larger guy, the the red hair? Clark or the ginger? The ginger. I believe that was uh, Bennings. George Bennings, yeah. Yeah, I, I felt like he was just kind of there, you know. I didn't say a whole lot. and uh, I mean, I, I don't want to get into the scene that happens later. That was kind of crucial. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, he We'll, seems we'll get there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's in the trailer. Uh, we see If you watch the trailer for this movie, that will spoil it for you, what happens to George Bennings. But uh, no, I, I completely agree with you, Jared. McCready is probably the character most people like the most from they make him charismatic they make him seem like a leader they make him seem like okay he's level-headed enough to not want to point the finger and murder everyone all at once he actually comes up with a test to kind of find out who could potentially be the thing so Mm -hmm. also really like nulls when the guy's like can you turn this music down i'm trying to sleep turns it all the way up (laughs) uh fun fact about that song uh, this will not be the fun facts and trivia, but I still remember it from watching the, some of the docu series last night. They didn't uh, Universal didn't have the rights to um, the song, 
Superstition. Oh. Superstition. Right. And and basically Universal didn't have the rights when they released the DVD. So they ended up releasing the DVD with a different song since now they got the rights back or something like that. Now they're able to actually have uh, uh, Superstition by Stevie Wonder being the song that they can play there. And I think the song that <laughs> I think Superstition fits way better, um, especially based on some of the reviews where they're like, uh, we don't we don't know what happened to that song with Nalls, but it's not right. It's not the right song. Uh, anyways, just a weird piece of information there. Just to think that you release a movie with this idea of it'll always be this way, and then if you lose to right, uh, lose the rights to something like that, you have to change the film, right? It can change the whole feeling of a scene, changing one song. It's crazy. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, and I, you, you definitely hit the nail on the head there, too, with the superstition fitting the, the paranoia themes. I, I, honestly, I think uh, that, that feeling you get as people start to distrust each other, I, I think that's what really does it for me in this film. Well, that song's on my, uh, you know, my Halloween playlist. Whenever I, I don't know, for some reason, whenever I hear that song, I get that weird, spooky feeling, which is kind of nice. Clark, so um, you said you liked McCready and mm-hmm. you liked Nalls. Did I miss who you disliked? Uh, honestly, I don't like Windows. You don't like Windows? Oh, man. I okay. don't like It's Windows' fault that this devolves into what it what it becomes my personal opinion like it it didn't exactly prevent everything but they lost several people because of his blunder and were he a bit more composed you're trying trying to testing scene later later on in the film he there's a moment where windows he essentially he okay he chokes he does yeah he he could have this this could have ended a bit faster that it could have ended differently I don't know if it would have because there there were other things going on, but with the with the way they kind of the, did the artistic direction, we could talk about this a little bit later. But it it just it's his fault, my personal opinion. Okay, so this is a really shitty moment in our episode because my favorite character is Windows. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because of his heroicness or because of his blunders or that he made some great decision in this movie. I just think of it as a character in the movie. I, I really like the humor he provides, especially as when he's in the room and they're yelling at him and they're like, come on, man, reach somebody. And he's like, they're like, reach anybody, man. We're a thousand miles away from nowhere. It's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets any better. <laughs> that poor guy. Like he, I don't know. He, I feel like he just gets shit on being the radio guy. And uh, I don't know. So I liked him a lot. Yeah, he's not the perfect character. He definitely screws up and prolongs so back, some problems for sure back to what you're saying so with the characters there are 13 people on the american base and I'm, i know we're kind of jumping back and forth but there's uh Nals, who's the cook you have fuchs and gary uh gary's kind of the the head of the office you have rj mcready windows like you said he's kind of the broadcast communications guy you have clark you have Do- george bennings dr blair palmer childs and then vance norris so i'm getting um, 12 who's 13 Dr. Copper, R.J. McCready, Nalls, Fuchs, Gary, Windows, Cooper, Clark, Bennings, Blair, Palmer, Childs, Vance, and then R.J. Okay. And, yeah, so Windows would be my favorite. Who did I like least? That's that's kind of hard. I don't know if I would say that. I, I mean, I guess, I don't know, Clark, because he just, that character in the movie gives me such the, the like, a heebie-jeebies the whole time. He's like a super red herring. He ends he, up, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. He, he ends up that, being nothing. Like he ends up not being a bad guy they, at all. He's just a creepy guy. They did that on purpose because remember, uh, Wilford Brimley's character was. I think he was pointing towards Clark, Doctor Blair. Yeah, he's he like, said, "Keep your eye on like, Clark." It ain't Fuchs. Look at Clark. Yeah, and what was the reason there? It was because uh, after the dog joins them at the um, uh, uh, at the base, I, I believe Clark was the person who took care of all the animals. Is that right? Yes, and for how yeah. long he was along with the dog. So if you were as the viewer were kind of watching this, you'd see like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It could be Clark because he was alone with the dog for an hour. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious how – oh, man. Th- we I, haven't even talked about this this part, though. We yet. haven't even gotten here, yeah. We, let's, let's go back to the synopsis here. Let's do it. When they're still in the, they're still in the Norwegian base and they find the body of this this thing – this creature and it's frozen and so they bring it back and this is before any of the stuff happens like 
before things start transforming or getting possessed. Yep. And then once they're back, that's when we kind of see things start to evolve. So we have the dog scene where the dog that came in uh, starts killing all the other dogs that are in the kennel with it. Mm. It was put in the kennel. It was roaming free for a couple of hours. And then it transforms and starts uh, integrating. And the, Wilfred Brimley's character, I, I don't remember his, his character's name, but um, it, it's one of the, he's one of the doctors, one of the three doctors. One of them's like doing an autopsy on that weird gross body thing as well as the, uh, the Norwegian. Mm-hmm. But we have two places where people can get infected now that we know of. The dog could have done it. And also this body they brought in could have done it. The abomination, yep. Mm -hmm. And Wilfred Brimley's character at this point, he's kind of investigating, he's like looking at how long can we actually get up, how long until everybody in the planet becomes part, becomes integrated as part of this uh, this being, or if it's a hive mind or just someone that duplicates people's, uh, people's DNA. It was like 2,700 hours, 27,000 hours. Yeah, so basically he's running in the algorithms on his computer, trying to calculate all this stuff. The one that I wrote down that I found interesting was that he realized there was a 75% chance that other members of the team could have been infected by the thing. So if you're talking 13 people of this team, right? So this small team and 75% of them could already be infected. I mean, you're looking, you're, there's only like what, three of you left that aren't going to be infected. Well, he said there was a 75% chance that someone in the crew was already infected. Right. Right. And and the so, fact that it would just exponentially grow, in my opinion, it would probably mm. just grow. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah. It's but crazy. Since it's in an Antarctica. And by the way, if you have not read that, uh, there's a short story by Clark's World, and I'll talk about this after again. I'd highly recommend you read it because it talks about the th this happening from the thing's perspective and how it's doing communion with other people's bodies. But uh, we'll yeah, remind people we, at the end. We'll we'll tell we'll let our listeners know where to go so they yeah. can check it out. So one of my favorite quotes was that the dog can the dog kennel scene, Clark, whenever they go, um, so <laughs> he goes to get, basically Max shows up with Clark and realizes that the dog, something terrible is going on. Like this thing is freaking out. Right. So then he, <laughs> he has the guy run to a child's and, uh, I can't remember who it is who's yelling at child's, but he's like, Mac wants a flamethrower. Mac wants what? <laughs> it's what he said. Now get a move on it. So he's like freaking out, trying to get child's down there with a the flamethrower. By the way, Child shows up last out of everybody. Shows up last with the flamethrower finally to handle this dog creature that escaped. It like it grows feet really fast and like tentacle hand things really fast and just springs like up veins. through the freaking floorboard and looks like part of it disappears while the other, the last piece of it gets killed. Which is something we should probably just touch on for a second. So Jared, let me ask you this: this thing this creature thing it can like remove part of itself and get away at any point in time while the rest of its cells and stuff die yet continue on living so in your opinion do you think like does that not freak you out because it scares the hell out of me yeah well honestly i think uh I, I think what gets me more is is the idea that if you're contaminated with even a little bit of, of this thing you slowly become like parts of your body slowly turn into that right so it's this mm. idea of you know you're contaminated there's nothing you can do about it you're just gonna you know become an alien and totally lose yourself you know they even explain that they say what's eat from cans from now on don't let anyone serve you food because yep. even a little bit can mutate and kill you yeah everyone serves as yourself. we see happen with one character later on mm -hmm. but uh, where he yeah, uh, dies yeah um, uh, yeah, Curtis, you're totally right, though. Uh, I, I don't want to go too far ahead, but there is that scene later um, that we sort of alluded to where uh, part of the body, part of uh, one of the thing's bodies is on fire and uh, its its head detaches itself to, oh, to yeah, try, yeah, yeah. And survive. try to get away. It, it's that, that I mean, uh, that's probably the scariest course. thing too. the <laughs> autopsy scene. Oh, because he dies. This is this is where everybody's like completely. Like moving away from the synopsis, just watch this movie. Highly recommend it. It's worth it. Uh, they don't trust each other at all after this point. After after uh, Wilfred Brimley's character kind of freaks out, and he's like, "It's it's it's Clark, it's Clark. It ain't Fuchs. 
kind of throwing a misdirection at us from every single angle because we as the viewers don't know who or what it is unless you look for very small things mm -hmm. that you wouldn't even know about unless you read about it. And uh, mm -hmm. no, 100% paranoia. Yeah, so the doctor realizes this. Like he realizes they don't, they literally don't know who's got what, what's going on, right? And this is Dr. Blair, which is the uh, Brimley's character. So Dr. Blair starts going on kind of a, a rampage and throughout the camp, throughout the facility, and he's like busting up comms so they can't communicate out. And he just looks like a madman. So first time viewer, you don't, I mean, you wouldn't realize. He also realize. ruined the helicopter. Uh, yes. Yeah, Before yeah, yeah. this point. Yes. So he destroyed the helicopter and part of the tractor. So he didn't ruin the tractor, I guess, but he kind of hurt part of it or something like that. Well, on that, can I, can I ask you guys, uh, and mm -hmm. I, I know it's a subject for debate, um, do you think he, he was tearing things, when he was tearing things up, how, how, do you think he was infected? Do you think he was trying to prevent them from calling out or, or escaping? Uh, or do you think he was trying to uh, you know, prevent the thing from leaving? Because we, we know by the end of the film that, that he becomes infected. But I think he was infected at this point, and he was playing the we don't know who's inflected, infected card, and also at the same time, destroying their communications out, like them from getting help stopping this thing. Mm -hmm. Personally, that's just where that's where I thought it was all happening. Um, especially because of how calm he is when they go and they put him in that shack prison. He's still very calm, and I don't know. At that point, I feel like he was already plotting. Like the thing was already plotting to get get the hell out of there. So, like, with the, so one of the things I want to touch on right now is they used some some they used some special lighting to put glints whenever there was a close up on someone's face, and if somebody was the thing, they would not have a glint in their eye when there was a close up. In most cases, the ending is kind of up in the air. If you look very carefully, you'll see that Wilfred Brimley's character does not have those glints in his eyes in any of his close-ups once he finds, once he's doing his rampage. Gotcha. So I don't, I'm not saying like that means he's been one of the things this entire time because I, I prefer to not know when did this happen, when did this actually transform, but mm -hmm. I think really good use of, uh, of that. I like it. A, that was a very clever thing to do uh, on the part of, uh, um, uh, I guess, John Carpenter or whoever was handling the lighting, right? Because that, I mean, the, the glint in the eye is something they do to, to add life um, just as an extra effect uh, for film and to take advantage of that uh, I think it's a really smart move and whoever noticed that <laughs> got to give him props because I, I definitely didn't catch that the first time around it's interesting too because another film that was released in 1982 that plays with the eyes is Blade Runner and I know I talk to Clark about this movie all the time because it's absolutely one of my favorite films of all time um, it's not horror so we'll never probably get a chance to do it on this podcast but um, they use a very similar trick with the eyes to give it uh, this this reflection, um, this shimmer, and that's how you can tell if someone is a replicant or not. And in this film with John Carpenter, we get a very similar effect to tell us if someone has been infected or not. It's it's just really clever um, and very interesting because both these movies were released same year around the same time in 1982, and we get two very similar eye tricks being played <laughs> yeah. awesome. so let's uh let's try to get back on track um let's talk about bennings let's talk about okay so they lock wilford brimley's character in this this shack outside or whatever wherever this is mm -hmm. and then they're they're back in the base one of the guys sees like tentacles wrapped around bennings he's like holy shit bennings is one of them and he runs out and tells everyone and they all jump in, and Bennings is gone. And they find him outside. He has, like, kind of tentacle hands. It looks like his transformation isn't fully complete, and he screams at them. This is actually in the trailer, mm -hmm. so if you want to see that scene, sure. But then they just burn him, and he's gone. That whole sequence was, I mean, it went from absolutely disgusting with with those tentacles on bennings like you see that and i i personally like i get a little shudder when i when i when i just when i see that scene and then uh when it when it gets outside and, and bennings is on the ground and he picks his hands up and and starts making that that noise oh man yeah yeah <laughs> it, it, 
was uh, it was absolutely amazing. I think I think they they shot it so well, and I, I really appreciated that. Yeah, those crab hands, man, lobster like crab hand things. I don't. It's it's trippy. It's very creepy. Um, but they did the right thing, I think, at this point, and they burned the body completely. They didn't like partially burn it. Like the abomination when they found it at the Norwegians' camp was only partially burned. Um, it was still sitting in smoky ashes, but it was still gooey, dripping, oozing. You could tell it was still very much so alive, living. Whereas with Bennings here, when they burn it, they actually burn the thing to where there's nothing but ash left, basically. Do you think that possibly when Wilford Brimley's character was doing the autopsy, him touching it could have infected him? I think so. I mean, like we talked about earlier, you know, prepare your own food, eat out of cans. Any drop can cause this thing to take over your body very simply. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's the hard part with this is something like this is just, I don't, we don't really know when this stuff happens. It just, it just did. We know it did. We just don't know when it's, it's freaking creepy, man. Um, you know, right now in, in real, in the real world right now, we have virus, the Carno, Corno virus or whatever happening. Coronavirus. Yeah. yeah. SARS, SARS was one of the coronaviruses too. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you know, these ideas, they're not just spawn off of completely fictitious things. I mean, there are little things that are happening every day that, you know, can, can cause something really weird like this to happen. Um, getting aliens involved, it, it's a little bit more of a stretch, but you never, I mean, you never know. Uh, I think uh, you touched on something there too. I think there's a reason uh, this film has done so well. Um, made in 82, totally bombed, managed to come back. Uh, a, a lot of the, the stuff they touch on, the themes and all that, um, really isn't time locked to, to the 80s. You know, like even now, like everybody, everybody feels paranoia. Everybody gets worried about, you know, the disease that that's going around, and uh, it really invokes a lot of that. Really, not having a cell phone. <laughs> and being trapped and isolated in Antarctica, and it's you with twelve other guys. It's, it's terrifying. <laughs> I mean, it is. <laughs> um, the the the, I don't know. I, I every time we keep so when we keep saying other guys, like that is something to note here as well. Um, this film has has no females in it. Uh, not not because they didn't want females, but because the one character that was a female who was going to play a doctor ended up getting pregnant um, and then having to have her baby right before they started filming. And the next man up kind of a thing was a man. So unfortunately, it did fall to an all-male cast, um, unlike the original. Here, yeah, go ahead. That makes more sense to me, to have all men in an isolated base like this. No, no offense, no, it's, and I'm not trying to be sexist. I just feel like men kind of all being alone, not seeing anything that they're attracted to for such a long time, they it's not a good thing. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the original movie had uh, one, I believe, one female in the cast. So it's not like this is a huge drastic change when it comes to story or anything like that. Um, but it was something that popped up you know, when, when reading about the movie. So just an interesting fact, we do keep saying 12 guys and we mean 12 guys. Um, it was these, <laughs> these gentlemen working together day in and day out. So let's get to the blood test. Cause this is my favorite part of the movie. This scene, um, to me is what keeps all these stories kind of tightly wrapped together, how they do it, how they achieve it was slightly different. Um, but in this one, Matt comes up with a blood test to find out who's infected and this is where it really begins, and this is where you really can tell, like, they can't trust one another because they don't even know who is currently infected anymore. So Blair, Dr. Blair, is locked up in his shack. Right now, we've got Clark tried to attack Mac, so Clark shot, or, uh, so Mac shot him in the head. They tie him to the table. Uh, Dr. Copper, is that the other doctor? I believe uh, Dr. Copper is also tied to the table, if I remember right. And then we've got Childs, uh, Gary, and what is that dude's name? The one, <laughs> Palmer, the the stoner. Yeah, the stoner. Palmer is tied to the chair together along with Windows, and we get the blood test. Um, classic scene. Cla <laughs> it's classic. So just to break it down real quick, uh, I guess Mac cuts their thumbs, puts some of their blood in these little petri dishes labeled with their name. He then takes a copper wire, strips 
the uh, plastic off the copper wire and then uses the flamethrower because that's how he's holding them all hostage at this moment. Um, uses the flamethrower to heat up the copper wire and then takes that copper wire and puts it in the Petri dish to see if it reacts. And he does it one by one. So he checks Clark. Well, unfortunately, Clark did not react. Clark's also dead. So I don't know if well, we can Clark, really use Clark it. was trying to stab him because he was paranoid, so he shot him in the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, Clark, Clark died. But it, Clark, this, everybody at this point is trying to kill each other. Nobody trusts anyone. Every nobody trusts McReady. Nobody trusts. Uh, yeah. But if Clark was, really him. if Clark was infected, he would have still reacted because he wasn't burned, right? Right, but no, not necessarily. He could have pretended that he was dead. So them checking his blood after he died was was very smart on their part. Right. I feel that they did this well. Him, he was like, okay, check their blood, and then he's like, wait, 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 Windows, let me let me check yours. So checking Windows, making sure that it wasn't Windows, that it wasn't him. But then they check one of the characters, and jump scare. <laughs> Dude, pops out. dude, that practical effect inside the petri dish, though. So when he hits the copper to it, this blood thing like grows into this like little blood tree right. in his hand. Um, just the practical effect there is had to have been awesome. And I wonder, like, those are the kinds of things I hope they didn't tell Kurt Russell's character that it was going to happen because I hope it's a real reaction. Like, I want him to really yeah. be freaked out from that. How funny would that be? It was really awesome. It, it was great. And that was when whoever the character is who is the thing kind of like starts transforming and everybody's like, get me out of this chair. Windows fucks up here. Oh, he has yeah. a flamethrower. It's on. It's ready to be used. Kurt Russell's, uh, RJ McReady's, his is not working the way he wants it to. He's having performance anxiety. <laughs> and Windows just, just stares at it. I don't know anything about per performance anxiety. I don't, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Windows is dead. Rip Windows. Rip Curtis's favorite character. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Windows Curtis. Is still, uh, Windows, Windows is still freaking out from that jump scare earlier, I think. Yeah, um, Windows... W ever, ever since this whole thing started, Windows has just been in shell shock. Well, can I, can I ask too... Um, so you, you, you mentioned the jump scare, but uh, I, I think one of the really important things about that scene is how, how, how slow it is, how, how, you know, the pacing... Because, uh, you know, jump scares in some movies, they feel cheap. They feel, you know, they were just there to get elicit a reaction. But uh, in this one, it works. And, and uh, you know, can, I just, it'd be great to hear your opinions. What, what, do you, what do you guys think of that? What do you think it was good? I think it's the, the tension that was being built by the whole entire moment. And we, as the audience, we don't know who it is. Uh, I, I, I didn't remember rewatching it. Um, you can tell I, I say I give out false facts sometimes. Like there were only twelve people on the base, but uh, no, one hundred percent. They built up the tension, and it wasn't just a jump scare. It was an escalation. It's like okay, now we're escalating it, and this is going to stay as high up as it can go because people are going to die now. Yeah, I mean, I agree. The pacing was slow, but I think it was purposefully slow. It was. Uh, it was one of those master of horror moments by by John Carpenter. He knew exactly what he was doing to build that tension and to get you hooked. Because, uh, like like Clark said, I mean, I I've, I've watched this movie a dozen times, and I forgot I I was I don't I don't know how or why, but I always forget uh, who sitting there in the lineup is infected. I thought I I could have sworn it was Childs, but uh, I was wrong. I for, I forgot it was Palmer and. Uh, it still never got me. Childs. It's never childs until the end. <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'll spoil that later. So Palmer ends up being one of the infected. Eats Windows head. Uh, Max. Mac are the ones who are now transforming. Yeah, and they burn him alive in the corner. Go ahead, Jared. Sorry to interrupt you there. Um, no, you're good. Do you guys think this sort of worked? Uh, I, I know. Well, maybe we shouldn't talk about it at all. But there was a 2011 prequel right that did a lot of cg do you guys mm -hmm. think this would have worked at all with with the cg or do you think that the practical effects were kind of core no they, that movie's garbage just so you know they actually <laughs> used practical effects for the 2011 release and they removed them for cgi and the practical effects looked better so it's questionable mm -hmm. uh fun fact about that it's not just a prequel but a remake 
So it leads, it's before everything and then leads up to the thing, uh, this film, this version, and then remakes that as well from what I've, from what I've seen. Yeah, uh, they, they reboot just... a couple of things and then they're like, oh, we're actually a prequel. But they've <laughs> yeah. essentially done screen by screen reshots of several tense scenes from the original film. So it's not, it's its own thing. Oh, lazy. Which we might talk about that at a later date too. We might have to just to, to rip it apart. Um, we don't do enough bad films on this show, and we need to. We need to force ourselves to watch some pretty shit stuff just so that way we're not doing fan service. Um, so, so Mac and the ones who aren't infected decide to go check on Blair, the first doctor right. f- from the beginning of the movie. And uh, then they realize. Wolf of Brimley's character. Uh huh. And they realize right. that he's been digging a tunnel underground his prison shack and building a UFO. So. This leads me to my final question of the synopsis, which is, Jared and Clark, do you think he's been building the UFO from scratch? Do you think the UFO was already there? Tell me your opinions. He took the parts from the uh, the helicopter as well as the uh, the cat, the snow, the ski cat. He's been taking parts. He's been t- he's been building it on his own. That's where he took a bunch of stuff and he put it underground. Um, at least that's. That's what I think. I don't know. He's been building kind of this weird craft. I don't know if he was ever going to complete it, though. Okay. Yeah, that's that's sort of where, I, where, where my head's at as well. Um, I, but the the question that sort of pops back in my head is is how how early do you think he uh, he started working on it? Even you know, see, he, he was. That's the struggle with me. Like, I don't know how long we're expected to think time has been going by. It's got to be only days. Like it, I don't. Uh, Kurt Russell's character mentions in that tape that he's recording that if they don't make it, please find the tape, whatever, that he hasn't slept in a few days. Mm-hmm. That he's just been running on, you know, empty. That's right. And and I feel like this isn't a week's thing or a month's thing. Um, so that leads me to believe, like, going down the same pa- path that you guys are going, I agree with you that he's using the parts from the helicopters that he destroyed and the, the cat, the, the tractor thing that he partially destroyed. But that's a pretty well-made UFO. Like, most of it, it's mm. solid, right? It's just crazy to think that um, most of that was built in that short period of time. I mean, what are the chances of it crash landing that little UFO there and the big-ass UFO back at the Norwegian, near the Norwegian base, right? For I don't all know. we know, it wasn't just him. Sure, Yeah. He he could have uh, him and a, a few of the others could have been working. Plus, the dogs could have how does, transformed. How does the thing do do that though? Like maybe he transformed to, to build it and wasn't imitating someone, and he was able to do it relatively quick with tentacles. But I don't know. This is one of those things that we can't really explain. Yeah. It, it's I don't know if we should take it seriously since it is just a movie, but. Fun to think about. Yeah. Yeah, and everybody at this point, when they discover him, like, they're underground, and they're, like, they're kind of splitting up the party here. Mm-hmm. Like, there are four of them. There's Childs. There's there's uh, Gary. There's, uh, is it Palmer? Palmer is the one who transformed and died in or, the... Or Vance. Um, Nalls is with them. Nalls, right, Nalls. So, you have Childs, Nalls. Uh, Gary and RJ McReady. Yep. And Doctor Blair puts his fa- his hands and just shoves his fingers <laughs> inside the face of uh, is it Nalls? Gary. Uh, Gary. It's Gary. Gary. Yeah. And he just like it's like him. He's like becoming part of him at this point. Mm-hmm. And when all this happens, like McReady's like, I don't know where this guy is, and uh. Like Childs is chasing Blair or something. Meanwhile, yeah, this is Nalls. that's this is the infamous part where they tell yeah. Charles to, uh, Childs to watch the door, and mm-hmm. Childs disappears because he, you know, later on we find out. But right at this point, this is the infamous scene where you don't know where Childs went, right. and this is where to me it's spider webs a little bit more, and you don't get mm-hmm. you don't get answers to this question. But keep but going, anyhow, keep like, going, yeah. There's like this kind of rupture in the ground, like an earthquake heading towards McReady and he has like he's ready to blow things up. Yeah, they've decided to burn this compound to the ground. 
Like, that's it. They don't want anybody escaping. They don't want anything happening. Just burn this place to the ground. And I think all the things have merged together at this point into one big monster. And you see, like, kind of this amalgamation of, like, a dog, a person, and a bunch of things. A clown from Killer Clowns. Yeah, <laughs> my ex-wife. And they pull, he pulls out, like, the dynamite and blows it up. Everything's on fire. And Kurt Russell is left outside with maybe some a flask of some clear liquor, liquor, and Childs appears. Yep. And they have a they have that conversation, which just there's no glint in Childs' eyes at all. Correct. And this is where people are like, "Is Childs a thing?" And John Carpenter has always on record said, "That's up for you to decide." On top of that, another piece of evidence. If you watch Kurt Russell when he breathes, he is breathing dragon fire smoke. Childs has no breath when he's breathing. So right. just take that as another, you know, um, piece of evidence to weigh on. But I do love I do love how they end it, the famous or the famous line at the very end there. What do you want to do? I don't know. Let's just wait it out. Let's see Wait. what happens. <laughs> if some one of us has any surprises for one another, I'm sure we'd know by now. Child drinks his, swigs his alcohol as, as well, and the movie fades to black. What a great uh, ad for Jim Beam whiskey. Am I right? <laughs> uh, Jared, you had a question? Oh, I, I was going to ask if you guys bought into... Uh, I know there's a fan theory that... Um, uh, that wasn't actually JMB in the bottle. That it was it was the kerosene that they were going to use for the the, the Molotovs downstairs. Um, do you guys buy into that? Or, or, or I you? hadn't read that. That sounds amazing. That's though. cool. Yeah. Well, so, so yeah. So uh, the the theory I had heard. Um, so they have the Molotovs downstairs that they're they're getting ready to use to to firebomb the the thing potentially. Um, when they go back up, uh, somehow uh, he still has one of those. The theory was that it it's, it's full of kerosene and he hands it to Childs to drink. Childs doesn't react, and then Kurt Russell laughs uh, after that. Oh my god, that's amazing! That's great. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna have to rewatch the end just so I can enjoy that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, definitely check it out. I mean, I'm on the okay. Let's take a vote. I'm on the side that Childs is a thing. Like I'm, I'm I, sold on. John it. Carpenter's confirmed it now. Yeah, yes. Yeah, people kept asking him. I think he got tired, and he just said yes. Stop oh, me. keep it! But oh, damn it, <laughs> I like I like being able to kind of spect yeah. kind of skeptic skepticize on what what's what. But mm. I like the idea that Wilford Brimley's character became a thing as soon as he did the autopsy. Mm. That any contact with it will turn you into one eventually, and Kurt Russell was going to eventually become one too, too, no matter what. Like it was some sort of virus. Yeah, yeah, he did say at the end, uh, "Should should we even make it out?" Right? Probably he said not. No. No. I do like that. Cool. What did you, What did you guys think of that ending, though? Did you Did you think that they did, did a good job? I know, I know there were there were one or two parts where I was kind of. Uh, I loved the movie. Uh, it, it's great. There are one or two parts where, like I mentioned, I love cosmic horror, so not seeing things sometimes is more powerful for me. Um, I think it's one of the best movies ever made in terms of horror. We have heroes who do what they can to prevent this from infecting the rest of the world. It's kind of like Doom in a way. Like if you've played Doom, like but the Doom Ring like killing everything in Mars and preventing everything from coming to Earth in a sense. Which it does anyway because obviously you have to make sequels. Next sequel of the thing, the whole world's going to be infected. Maybe they'll just remake it again. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> make a sequel. Make it change. Change the way the movie works. Just uh, use the same same aspect, but now you don't know who to trust around you. Similar to uh, the pod people. So, to answer your question personally, I don't. I love everything about this movie. I think it's a great film. Um, like I said, I'm a fanboy for John Carpenter, so anything with his name on it, I tend to to like, even if others don't. Uh, but one thing that I can't agree with in this movie is that ending before before um mac goes out and child shows up i really don't like that like mine shaft style scene with the thing fight i just think that fight was pretty pretty lame 
in comparison to the rest of the suspension uh, or, or suspense uh, that that's built in this movie to have that be like the big grand finale seemed very quick and easy. Um, some of, some of the practical effects in this movie were, weren't too great, but most of them were pretty on par. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially for, really especially for a 22 year old doing them. 22. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. The guy was 22. Um, that was working on the, the practical effects. What's his name? I know I have it somewhere here in my fun facts and trivia, which it's time to get into. So before you guys hijack, let's get started with some fun facts and trivia. And we'll we'll find his name somewhere in here. Okay, first one I've got. At around 15 minutes in the movie, when the dog wanders down the hallway, pauses outside the door, we see a shadow of one of the men beckoning it in. John Carpenter wanted to be mysterious which character was involved, so didn't use any of the actors. We talked about that one. Uh, The film's considered a benchmark in makeup and special effects. The effects were created by Rob Botton, who was only 22 when he started the project. So, Mr. Botton, thank you. Really enjoyed your special effects. This is the first of John Carpenter's films which he did not score himself. The film's original score composer was Jerry Goldsmith, but he passed, and Ennio Morricone composed a very low-key, Carpenter-like score filled with brooding, menacing bass chords. So I like John Carpenter's music that he does usually for his movies. So to hear that this wasn't him, yet I still thought it was for a very long time, is awesome. I actually thought this was probably one of the best tracks in any of the films. So the fact that it wasn't him, I still like it. Pretty cool. The autopsy scene had real animal organs used in it. Oh, gross. John Carpenter considers this to be the first of his Apocalypse trilogy. Prince of Darkness came out in 1987, that is two, and In the Mouth of Madness came out in 94. They com- uh, comprise the other two parts of the trilogy. So Clark and I have talked about this a few times. Um, we'll get to the other two parts of that trilogy in the future. Nick Nolte turned down the role of McReady, as did Jeff Bridges. Bill Lancaster wrote the script for Harrison Ford and Clint Eastwood in the lead role, and both men were considered. On top of this, a relatively unknown Fred Ward campaigned for the role. So to think that it you know, wound up in Kurt Russell's uh, lap is pretty cool, um, especially because of the friendship that John Carpenter and Kurt Russell actually have. Um, think Escape from New York and some of the other films they've done together. All it's this. Pretty neat. Big Trouble in Little China. Big Trouble Little China. The four, the four Kurt Russell, John Carpenter films. <laughs> They're good. Um, Elvis see. is okay. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend Elvis. Um, unused music composed for this film was later used by Ennio Morricone in Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight, which just came out in 2015. Ironically, the Thing score was nominated for a Razzie, and when it was used in The Hateful Eight, it actually won an Oscar. So a Razzie is the I think the award for like the worst thing done in entertainment this past yeah. year. So for the thing, it was nominated for the worst thing, but when he put it in the Hateful Eight, it was actually nominated and won an Oscar. So what a change in times from 1982 to 2015. I love Beauty's it. in the eye of the beholder. You're beautiful, Clark. You're beautiful. Kurt Russell took a drag on a cigarette at the beginning of certain shots in order to make his breath appear more visible. This is very interesting when you think about the end of the film, which means he uh, openly and and on purpose probably had cigarettes smoke before he did the scene with Childs to make sure that his breath was very apparent. Not sure we can read too much into that, especially since I don't even know if John Carpenter really wanted to pick anybody there at the end. I don't know. No, it was great. It was fantastic. Loved it. And my final piece, and this is probably my favorite fun fact and trivia for this movie because of how um, this movie could have turned out had this happened. Toby Hooper was originally slated to be the director and to co-write the film before John Carpenter was attached. So if you don't know who Toby Hooper is, he did Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the first one. Mm. That film was supposed to be a dark comedy horror um unfortunately it was turned more into just a dark horror um when toby hooper then went on to do the sequel there is more comedy used throughout that one when he was going to get a hold of this movie his version would have been drastically different from the carpenter version featuring an alien that did not shapeshift or assimilate following an ahab-like character named the captain 
who goes on a quest to find and kill the thing, the film would have served as both a sequel and a remake to the film with influence from John Campbell Jr.'s novella. Hooper also wanted the film to be a dark comedy horror with slapstick humor throughout, but the producer, Drew Turner, was allegedly appalled by this pitch version and eventually fired Hooper, leading us to get this wonderful film done by John Carpenter. And that Probably concludes my fun facts and trivia. I love it. Three things I want to point out real quick. I know we're, we're kind of, we're running long right now. That's okay. But Blair apparently ran away and Childs lost him. I uh, don't know if that's true. Number two, check out this. Uh, there's a short story by Peter Watts. That's yes. W-A-T-T-S, Watts. It's on ClarksWorldMagazine.com. Uh, it's it was nominated for a 2000 2011 was nominated for a Hugo Award. It's kind of a fan fiction, but it's taken in the perspective of the thing, and it's very well written. I enjoyed the first part. Um, started reading it last night. Didn't realize how long it was, so did not finish it. But I definitely like the perspective that it portrays. I think it's really fun so far, and I can't wait to finish it. We will drop the link to it. Um, in the description for the episode, so that way in case you want to read it uh, after listening to us, you can. And I would actually suggest that you go check it out, because it's, like I said, it's pretty good, and I'm only I'm only one part in. So before we uh, we end the podcast, uh, and before we get into kind of our Instagram and our email, Jared, what are you up to? What would you like? These days, uh, not a whole lot. Uh, the new Star Wars movie came out. That made me pretty angry. So I, uh, I started reading... Um, uh, the Thrawn trilogy, uh, which the books came out a little while back, but uh, basically, great takes books. Right after the fall of the Empire, um, uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn comes back from uh, you know far reaches of space, where he's uh, 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 subjugating planets pretty much, and takes control of the remaining Empire forces to to try and defeat the uh, the New Republic. It's pretty good. I, I just finished the first book, and and I'm looking forward to the next two. Nice, Curtis. Uh, yeah, so lately I've been reading a book called Berkeley Street. Uh, it's written by Ron Ripley, and it's about this guy, Shane Ryan, who returns to Nashaw with childhood memories of this house that his parents uh, raised him in, and it's filled with ghosts and supernatural beings, um, and his parents end up disappearing 20 years prior, and he finally wins the house in some like legal battles or whatever. Um, but it's really good so far and, uh, and yeah, I, I can't suggest it enough. It's called Berkeley street. Like I said, it's on Amazon. I have it on my Kindle and, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun so far. I, it looks like it might be a part of a series, so I might be in for a really long, long, long read, which is exciting. Clark, you got anything cool that you've been doing lately besides drawing penises in chat? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Getting called out. Uh, yeah, I rolled my knee uh, oh, no. yesterday morning when I was at the boxing gym. I was doing battle ropes, and they made me do jumping jacks on top of that. And, uh, yeah, so I got a little sprain, but otherwise, not too much going on in, on the, the on things I'm looking into and enjoying other than just trying to be a Mimi fit boy. We're still playing Dead by Daylight. Always. Uh, Minecraft. Which maybe Minecraft, we'll have to talk yeah. about Minecraft a little bit more in another oh, episode. <laughs> the horror aspects of fighting the Wither. By um, the way, Jared, Jared plays Minecraft with us, and he needs to get online because there may or may not be some chickens in his house now. <laughs> oh wait, you're right. That's who we went and messed with. Whoops. <laughs> we we pull pranks on people, and we uh, we we throw chickens in their houses. Yeah, if you're not throwing chickens in your friends' houses in Minecraft, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Well, now let's get into the social plugs uh, and make sure that everyone knows how to follow us at the number two guys horror pod on Instagram and Twitter. We appreciate you guys. Uh, we actually we're we're really cruising along here. Um, I, I think we're starting to grow a really good following, and I am super excited uh, just to think about the things that we have coming up in the future possibly going to some um, conventions, making some appearances there. We might do a live show if we can uh, swing one. But yeah. Um, the Phoenix used to be Phoenix Comic Con. It's, it's potential. It's not necessarily going to happen. But uh, we're looking into it. There's also the Mad Monster Conference. Mm -hmm. 
uh, this year. It's later on, uh, I believe it's in the summer, so we got a little bit more time to plan that one um, and figure out if we can hit hit that one up. I know, uh, what's her name? Nev Campbell? Uh, right. Yeah, Sydney from Scream is going to be there. So I'm down because Scream is by far my favorite horror film, um, and to meet Nev Campbell would be amazing. Do you like scary movies? I love scary movies. You Thanks son too. of a bitch. I'm in. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks for having me. Peace. Bye-bye.